My name is Anya Parampil. I'm a journalist with the Gray Zone, and I'm very happy to be co-chairing this people's mobilization to end war and save the planet today. Uh, I want to give my co-chairs a chance to introduce themselves, but first I just wanted to talk a little bit about how this event came to be. It started as an idea after a group of us involved in the Embassy Protection Collective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots of, lots of uh, EPCers in the, in the crowd today. A group of us decided that we wanted to try and harness all of the energy, which was a very inspiring people's-led movement in Washington, D.C., standing directly up to the Trump administration's coup policy and the empire. We wanted to take that energy and, and build a wider movement and really start to talk about the illegal actions the U.S. government is taking not just against Venezuela, but countries like Iran, Russia, China, Zimbabwe, Cuba, Nicaragua. And we decided that the UN General Assembly would provide the perfect space to gather US citizens who believe in international law and the UN Charter to come to New York City and say, we reject the illegal actions of our government. We believe in, in a foreign policy based on mutual cooperation and sovereignty. And so a group of about what became eventually 75 organizations came together to build this, this march that is gathering today. And we have a very, very wonderful list of speakers who will be who will be on stage shortly. And so, before I introduce the first speakers, I just wanted to give the, my co-chairs a chance to say a little something as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sadika, and I'm with Fire Fight for Immigrants and Refugees uh, Everywhere. Uh, and before we start, I want to start off with a chant. So if everyone can repeat after me, money for jobs and sorry, money for jobs and education, not for war and occupation. Jobs and education, not for war and occupation. Okay, I'm gonna get to my next. One. Hi, my name is Dehako, and I'm I'm with the People's Mobilization. Um, you know, while in the news lately, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, improving domestic policy, but we also need to put a, a, a light on foreign policy and the implications that it has for the rest of the world, and then also how it comes back to affect things here at home. All right. Yep, so thank you everyone for being out here today. We also have been hearing a lot about climate change uh, in the lead up to the UNGA. There was a huge march. Uh, to save the planet on Friday, but I, I, I think many of you would agree that uh, we could center the conversation about climate change and the environment a little bit more around the military and the Pentagon, the largest producer in the world. I personally feel like that's for some reason always missing from the mainstream media's coverage of the climate catastrophe. And without any further ado, I guess we should just get to our speakers. We'll start with Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zies. They're the co-directors of Popular Resistance and they also are members of the Embassy Protection Collective, two people that I have so much admiration for and they were so awesome to be with inside of the Embassy. They're super true leaders. Can't wait to hear what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. It was amazing to be in the Embassy with you and with all of the Embassy Protectors. It created what we called an unintentional community, but it was an amazing community of people who came there because we care about the rule of law. We didn't want to see the United States violating the rule of law, violating the Vienna Convention, violating the United Nations Charter by conducting regime change in Venezuela. And so um, everybody worked together really well to try to hold that space for as long as we could to keep the illegitimate opposition leader, Juan Guaido, and his people from uh, usurping that and taking it over. So, um, so we're very excited that, and honored that we were able to do that. But this is a bigger problem. 
because the United States is violating international law pretty much every day. And we're dropping out of treaties, we're violating treaties, and it's time for this to stop. It's time for the U.S. to be held accountable and every country to be held accountable to international law because all of these things, the unilateral coercive measures, also called sanctions, are illegal. The threats of military aggression and acts of war are illegal. And so um, we have a new initiative, the Global Appeal for Peace, to create a popular movement that is worldwide that says no more war, we can resolve our conflicts through negotiation and diplomacy and respect for law. And I'll let Kevin say a few words. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, you know, every day when I wake up and look at what's happening in the news, it becomes the U U.S. violations of international law seem to come almost every day. Just this week, two Cuban uh, diplomats were directed to leave the country for it seems like no reason. Uh, it seems like it was for speaking. Uh, it's just bizarre. And then you you, you see the foreign minister uh, of Iran, uh, Zarif, uh, sanctioned and limited where he can go. Why? Because he's representing Iran. They said what? You're punishing for the foreign minister of Iran for representing Iran. It's absurd. And so we have this event uh, tomorrow night, which I hope that you'll all come to. Uh, if you haven't signed up or you need to, we need RSVPs because there'll be uh, ambassadors and diplomats along with civil, civil society activists speaking at it. And we want, want to check and see who's going to be there. So please check out peoplesmob.org for this event tomorrow night. It's going to be an important event, especially after this action against Cubans. Because diplomats from targeted countries are going to be speaking in the United States, criticizing the United States. Now that seems to be why the Cubans are being told to leave. I'm not sure why they're being told to leave, but that seems to be it. So we really appreciate them coming. We want to be out, make sure people are out there to show support. And it's part of building an international network to stand for the rule of law. And one thing we learned at the embassy in Georgetown was the U.S. will violate international law. They invaded that embassy without more than a hundred police, many militarized, a uh, battering ram on the door, uh, breaking in an invasion of an inviolable space that they're supposed to, the U.S. is supposed to protect, not violate. And they violated the international law to come in and illegally arrest us. We were there with the permission of, of the elected government of Venezuela, the recognized government uh, at the U.N., legal under Venezuelan law, and we were forced to be arrested for no real crime and we're facing federal prosecution. Let's end with a quick chant. It goes like this. No coup, no war, no sanctions anymore. No, no coup, coup, no war, no sanctions anymore. No coup, no war, no sanctions anymore. All right, thank you. Solidarity. It is very true that the U.S., we saw very clearly how far the U.S. government would go in violating international law when it used the tactics that it uses against the Venezuelan people, against its own citizens who were protecting the diplomatic premises of the Venezuelan embassy at the invitation of the internationally recognized government. They essentially carried out a siege. They prevented food from getting inside. They cut off the electricity, even though the U.S. denies that it had any involvement in the power outage in Venezuela earlier this year. I think it said something that this was one of the first or one of their most desperate tactics that they used against their own citizens in the United States as well. Moving on, we have Black Alliance for Peace. I want to introduce Asantewa Nkrumah Toure. Whoa. Somebody help me with the mic, please. Uh, just like this, I wanted to stay there. Gotcha. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asantoir Nkrumah Toure, and I'm a dues-paying member of Black Alliance for Peace. We want to thank everyone for organizing this event, and thank you all for coming out in this lovely afternoon. First, we want to say that we at Black Alliance for Peace join with you in demanding that the United States of America cut its obscene military budget and use that money for more helpful things such as affordable housing, substance abuse treatment, clean water for everybody, whether in Flint, Michigan or Newark, New Jersey. We are unapologetically opposed to the increasing militarization of police departments and we agree with our comrades at Jewish Voices for Peace and call for the end of police being trained in Zionist Israel. Also, let's say one more thing about the police in the United States. We say no police cooperation with ICE. No police cooperation with ICE. Children belong with their families and not in cages. We call for the permanent closure of all U U.S. military bases around the world and the United States must clean up the surrounding areas where these bases are located. We only have to look at Vieques and our beloved Puerto Rico where that area has a high rate of cancer. This must end. We also say shut down AFRICOM, U.S. out of Africa. Shut down AFRICOM, U.S. out of Africa. We demand that all U.S. military personnel leave the continent of Africa. We also respectfully ask all of you to organize and put public pressure on all these candidates for public office, whether they be at the city, council, city, county, state, or national level, to address these important issues. Because in, this, in days and times like this, increasing militarization also means increasing threats to the planet and to the climate. All these issues are connected. We also want to say for our young people this past weekend, we are grateful to Greta Thornburg, Isra Hersey, I want to say that name again, Isra Hersey, co-founder and co-director of the U.S. Youth Climate Strike and the millions of young people around the world that courageously organize rallies to demand climate justice. We thank them for continuing the work for environmental and climate justice that has been going on for many years. Let's support these young people. We can mentor the young people, but let's get out of their way and let them do this work too. Let us also remember, my comrades and friends, that all social justice issues are connected. They don't operate in a vacuum, they are all connected. So this year, we want to mark the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion here in New York City. A rebellion by LGBTQ folks against police harassment led by our transgender sisters, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who was also a Puerto Rican independentista and an activist against the Vietnam War. This year, comrades and friends, also marks the 50th anniversary of the Chicago police murder of Black Panther Party members Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. So let's remember this history, let's organize to make our voices and our presence felt, and let us continue to organize and fight back and win in honor of all those who have gone on before us. So get your fist up, everybody. I say get your fist up and repeat after me. Organize. Organize, fight back, fight back, organize, organize, fight back, fight back. Thank you. Hi everyone, next up I would like to introduce Nikki from Bayan. Bayan USA is an alliance of anti-imperialist national democratic organization here in the U.S. Bayan uh, USA is the largest uh, chapter of Bayan Philippines, an alliance of over 100 organizations and over 2 million members around the world. So Nikki, come up safe.
Hello, repeat after me. From Palestine to the Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. From Palestine to the Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. Warm and militant greetings, everyone. My name is Nikki Pagulayan, and I'm with Vine USA, an anti-imperialist democratic, national democratic Filipino alliance here in the U.S. fighting against the three basic problems of imperialism, bureaucratic capitalism, and feudalism. We are here today in reaffirming our place as a national democratic union our movement, our unity with all of you today in the global mass movement against US-led imperialist war and militarism and ultimately empire. We are here today to say that in light of the international climate strike this week, it's important to remember that the military is the number one fossil fuel consumer in the world, that US imperialism is the biggest enemy to our people and our environment. And we are here today to say that the fight for our environment, our planet, to resist war and militarized violence and fascism, to fight for genuine peace, is to fight for the end of class society. Because what the ND movement sees in the Philippines is that we cannot separate the call to end all war and US-backed war in the Philippines without calling for genuine socioeconomic change. Because for every neoliberal economic policy prog and program that Rodrigo Duterte puts on the table, charter change, train law, build, 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 policies that uphold foreign intervention in our domestic economic development, are U.S. stamped and approved policies that do not benefit our people, but instead the foreign imperialist powers and multinational companies and government cronies. There is a, for every economic policy, there is a military agreement or counterinsurgency program to ensure its implementation, to ensure that the fascist U.S. Duterte regime and the U.S. can ensure its economic hold of the Philippines. It's no coincidence that U.S. aid exerts its biggest impact on the setting of national economic policies. It's important to make some time to go into these examples because it show, goes to show how desperate Duterte and the U.S are in defending their economic control. We have Oplan Kapayapaan, a counterinsurgency program that only has resulted in further slaughter and exploitation of our landless peasants, our union leaders, our indigenous people fighting for their self-determination. It is programs like these, copied and pasted from the U.S. counterinsurgency handbook, that there are recorded 266 victims of politically motivated extrajudicial killings as a direct result. These programs target unarmed civilians standing up against unjust and anti-people government policies and corporate projects that displace our people. Just this past August, I want to talk about Brandon Lee, a Cordillera Human Rights Alliance paralegal volunteer and human rights officer in Ifugao who was shot multiple times by alleged elements of the 54th Infantry Batal Battalion of the Philippine Army. This, murder took this attempted murder took place after Brandon was marked an enemy of the state and the IBPA intensified its harassment and surveillance of Brandon. Originally from San Francisco, California, Brandon moved to the Philippines in 2010 and is the first U.S. citizen to fall victim to the Duterte regime's counterinsurgency program. Brandon Lee is still fighting for his life and there is a fundraiser right now to ensure that he gets an airlift home back to the United States so he can continue his care and ensure its safety. This is just one example. Duterte recognizes, for example, the settler colonial fascist Israel as a supplier of weapons for the reactionary AFP, apart from over 20 business agreements signed worth $83 million. So as Israel continues its genocidal war against the Palestinian people, Duterte can only forge such a strong partnership that is not only explicitly fascist, but also so strongly allied, allied with the U.S. So therefore, we have to recognize that Duterte's tyranny is through the brain, the support, and the interest of the U.S. and pundits in D.C. Because of unequal military agreements such as the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement and the Visiting Forces Agreement that allow U.S. troops to occupy military bases and conduct military exercises so they please on Philippine soil and dependence on U.S. military technology, hardware, and expertise. While Trump was on his imperialist tour of Asia, he pledged 
to he pledged to provide 14 million dollars of military aid and quote unquote rehabilitation in Marawi and two million dollars to Duterte's drug war that has killed 30,000 people. The U.S. has provided over 85 million in dollars in counterterrorism related equipment, training, and support to the Philippine military. In 2018 alone, Trump is asking for $64 billion for this program that allows the U.S. to have a stronger military presence, including direct intervention in the Philippines, a violation of the Philippine Constitution. And the best, just a month ago, the Philippine National Police and the U.S. Department of State just signed an agreement to establish a counterterrorism training center in Southern Tagalog, a region where the National Democratic Movement is strong and vibrant. In the context of Trump's repression of migrants, activists, and oppressed people in the United States, along with his warmongering around the world, the, the martial law in Mindanao opposed by Duterte is an extension of Trump's tyranny abroad. And Marawi, still to this day, has not recovered from this U.S.-sponsored massive anti-terrorist campaign. The U.S. has spent over $6 trillion on wars in the Middle East and Asia since 2001 alone. Just this past June, the Department of Defense announced a contract agreement for 34 drones in the Asia-Pacific region. I also want to give a quick shout out to organizations out in Seattle pushing the Who's Boeing, Who's Boeing bombing campaign because it's sites of U.S.-backed devastation such as Marawi where these drones are used. Our taxpayer dollars should be going to things like education, healthcare, housing, not funding the destruction of our land and death of our people, not funding the police that terrorize and kill our black and brown siblings, not funding ICE or border patrol agents to attack and imprison and separate our migrant communities. So in the face of these attacks of U.S.-backed counterinsurgency programs like Oplan Kapanatagan, in the face of martial law in Mindanao, in the face of brutal state repression towards all forms of organizing, in the face of Duterte's killing spree on the urban poor, in the face of militarized violence by multinational companies and paramilitary groups against indigenous people defending their land and life, in the face of suffering Filipinos across the archipelago who take up arms to fight for genuine self-determination, it is clear that my people, the Filipino people, have this courage to defend themselves by any means necessary. And if this is the courage exercised by my people, then we have the courage as anti-war and anti-imperialist activists here to weaken imperialist powers such as the U.S. from within, to unite all anti-war and peace-loving groups, to ensure that the most exploited and oppressed across the world no longer need to exercise their courage against imperialist war and fascism, but to exercise their courage and vision towards building a new world beyond these things. So as Bayan, as a member of the International League of People Struggle, we call on our comrades and organizations here today in resisting U.S.-led war and militarism in all forms. We call for peace based on justice and solidarity among peoples through the recognition of self-determination, economic sovereignty, and self-defense against imperialist violence. Today marks our commitment to resisting imperialist war and building peace because we have had enough. We know our task. We know we must build the mass movement against U.S.-led war to ensuring imperialism has no ground to stand on. And we can only stay on task if our perspective is clear and material with the class consciousness that guides this difficult work. So as the crisis of imperialism has plunged the world deeper into militarism and war and ecological destruction, as oppressed people, as colonies and semi-colonies alike of imperialist powers bear the brunt of these attacks, we know our work in supporting the people's movement across the world and at our own front door fighting for their self-determination and freedom from imperialist masters. The commitment to end war is a commitment to ending class society. Our enemies are afraid because they know our capability not only destroying this corrupt system but our readiness to reign a socialist future. Today is our commitment to the world that we will not only win but the world we will build and the national democratic movement of the Philippines is here to build that world with you. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Great, I want everyone to repeat after me. We're gonna chant a little bit. U.S. Empire, you can't hide. We can see your gangster side. <laughs> Great. Next up, I would like to uh, introduce peace activist uh, Jan Weinberg from Show Up America.
Mic check. Stop war. Save the planet. Stop war and save the planet. Thank you for joining in on this glorious last day of summer with the people's mobilization to stop the U.S. war machine and save the planet. I said I am grieving, and yet the political class doesn't redress my grievances. The erosion of civil liberties, the threats of violence, the abuse of human rights, the defiance of international laws when instituted by our own government must be addressed head on at the time the actions or inactions are taken. I am grieving. It was prohibited for the commander in chief of the United States Army to wield the powers ascribed to Congress by the Constitution. And yet, a succession of complacent Congresses permitted the office of the Imperial Presidency to take root and flourish in the compost heap of our Constitution. The United States Congress, over a period of decades, willfully abdicated the constitutionally ascribed foreign affairs authority to regulate international trade, including trade negotiations to impose and withdraw sanctions and tariffs and embargoes and the responsibilities entrusted to them when called upon by the most unfortunate of circumstances to deliberate and then vote whether or not to declare war. To engage the military division of the war machine was not to be in the hands of one person, the President, the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Armed Forces, I am grieving. At this moment, while we're standing in the very heart of Imperial America's shopping district, U.S. military forces against the will of the people have taken up residency and are occupying many, many other nations, including island nations, far from our borders. The platitudes of protecting our national interests has become their preposterous explanation for occupation and exploitation. Listen carefully and you will hear the pleadings from peace activists in Okinawa, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, Jeju, the Azores, to just name a few. I said I am grieving and yet the political class is not redressing my grievances. You cannot have a political and social revolution if you ignore the consequences of United States government corporate collusion perpetrated violence. You cannot have a successful new Green Deal if you leave off the calculations of United States military exorbitant use of nuclear and fossil fuels and fail to address the consequences of war and the preparation of war as catastrophic environmental humanitarian issues. The close and far-reaching consequences of American empire, perhaps more aptly described as imperial America, rarely anticipated by the critical class, are not discussed nor even a whisper on the debate stages, the interviews, the speeches, forever campaigns, forever wars. Remember as activists, as educators, as diplomats, as citizens, that tomorrow, Monday, September 23rd, marks the first day of autumn. Let's hearken in a new season for humanity and this unique, glorious home of ours. We, by striving together and supporting and encouraging one another, shall persevere through the winter, spring, and summer of our discontent. We stand at the threshold of a new season. Tomorrow marks the first day of autumn, the beginning of the fall of the American empire. Thank you. All right, everybody, how about a little music? All right, next up we have Ben Grosskop of No More Sacrifice Zones. Uh, ben uses the power of song to amplify ideas and values of the liberation movements. He serves as the executive director of the People's Music Network for Songs of Freedom and Struggle, a diverse community of singers, poets, activists, and allies that cultivate music and cultural works as catalysts for a just and peaceful world. 
Let's give it up for Ben. The song is called No More Sacrifice Zones. And I'm going to invite you guys to sing along with me when we get around to the, uh, the repeating part, the chorus. This is a song about what well, you'll hear. The army closed you in as they drove you from the plains. They're turning your homeland to a sacrifice zone. The company took the uranium, just the fallout remains. They're turning your homeland to a sacrifice zone. Where your story's been forgotten, we will make it known. Sing that part with me. We will make it known. We will make it known. Try that one more time. Just five notes. We will make it known. I'm starting to feel that. Pine Ridge, you are not alone. Your homeland has been desecrated. The next could be our own. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. You can sing that two more. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. The state makes voting obsolete through emergency decrees. They're turning your city to a sacrifice zone. The cops occupy your street to bring you to your knees. They're turning your city to a sacrifice zone where your story's been forgotten. Where your story's been forgotten. We will make it known. We will make it known. Ferguson, you are not alone. Ferguson, you are not alone. Your city has been subjugated. The next could be our own. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. The coal men blew the mountain, killing everything nearby. They're turning your region to a sacrifice zone. The state refuses to help your people as you watch them die. They're turning your region to a sacrifice zone where your story's been forgotten. Where your story's been forgotten, we will make it known. Appalachia, Appalachia, you are not alone. Your region has been desolated, the next could be our own. No more sacrifice zones, no more sacrifice zones. The profiteers will cut you down if you're in their way. They're turning your country to a sacrifice zone. The bombs that kill your children came from the USA. They're turning your country to a sacrifice zone where your story's been forgotten. Where your story's been forgotten, we will make it known. Yemen, Yemen, you are not alone. 
Your country has been decimated. The next could be our own. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. Where your story's been forgotten, we will make it known. Pine Ridge, Ferguson, Appalachia, Yemen, Immokalee, Flint, Michigan, Northern Alberta, and Camden, Standing Rock, Navajo, Palestine, and Puerto Rico. We stand with you, you are not alone. Your lands and lives were sacrificed, the next will be our own. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. Hello? Oh, there we go. All right, let's give it up for Ben again. Yeah. Next up, we have uh, Greg Shwedlock. Uh, Greg Shwedlock has been in the uh, climate emergency movement since 2014 when he took on a leadership position with the climate mobilization. Uh, he convened uh, the Extinction Rebellion New York, C uh, New York City chapter. Please give a welcome to Greg. Hello, New York City. People's mobilization. An old Chinese proverb says, to know and not to act is not to know. At Extinction Rebellion, we start with the premise of our first demand to tell the truth. And the truth is, we are in the middle of the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history. The truth is climate change equals mass murder. The truth is climate breakdown equals more war. The truth is more war equals more climate chaos. When we're asked whose extinction we are rebelling against, the truth is it is humanity's extinction we are discussing. This is nothing new to the peace movement. Human extinction has been on the table since the anti-nuclear movement and the clamshell alliance. The only update is that the timer on the climate bomb has already been activated. And there are hundreds of positive feedback loops speeding up the countdown. The truth is we are too late for a moral solution. That ship has sailed 30 years ago. We are not staying below 1.5 degrees. We are not staying below 2 degrees warming. We do not have 12 years. Long before sea levels rise and wipe away our homes, climate refugees will rise exponentially. Long before heat strokes kill us directly, wars will. If we do not take the time to let this sink in and grieve and support each other, how can we act? This is an emergency. We need to act like it. And I know you are ready to take action. You have never been more ready to take action. Extinction Rebellion's second demand is to act now, to get to zero emissions by 2025. Just because there's going to be tragedy and suffering doesn't mean we can't reduce the, the degree, doesn't mean we can't find our humanity in the face of losing our humanity. To find our solidarity, our music, our intersectionality, and our poetry in nonviolent direct action. You are looking for action that will have the greatest impact, for the vehicle that can move the needle. XR is a rebellion, a rebellion in the face of criminal inaction of our governments around the world to keep us safe. With all my heart, it is my belief that it is the vehicle even if we are still making it while we are driving it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it is an exciting time to be alive. Every third generation makes history, and it's been there, been three, 
generation since the greatest generation, we are overdue for a momentous shift in human history. Of all the arguments humans have made against war over the millennia, none have worked. However, that is about to change. Because either we will destroy ourselves and there will be no more wars to be had, or we will win and allocate all our energy and our resources to climate justice and saving and the survival of complex life on Earth. In less than a year since Extinction Rebellion NYC began, we've had dozens of actions, over 300 arrests, thousands of supporters. We've had solidarity actions with Kosecha and Close the Camps and Newark Water Coalition. Almost every evening, we have now have multiple overlapping events. It's no longer possible to attend every event, even if you wanted to. <clears throat> Local neighborhood groups are springing up left and right. Since our launching, launching our campaign, to wake up the oh-so-liberal New York Times, we've, held, we've had them withdraw from sponsoring oil conference. We've got the city of New York to declare a climate emergency. Across the pond last April, London was shut down for 10 days by Extinction Rebellion. 10 days. Paris and the UK Parliament itself declared climate emergencies. And the Green Party there is making historic wins when all Mother England previously could talk about and bicker about was Brexit. And of course, the youth are out in record numbers. It is the beginning of the tide, but it is just the beginning. But none of this, that is going to repair to the global rebellion we're going to kick off on Monday, October 7th. Cities across the world will be shut down, including London, Paris, Berlin, Madrid, Amsterdam, and New York. So, I want to invite you to join these cities as they aim to surpass last April's 10-day shutdown. Be part of history and let all the world see that the U.S. is on the board. To be clear, you do not have to be arrested. But this will be the largest globally coordinated disruption the Western world has ever seen. You will put the world on notice. Business as usual will be put on notice. In case it's not already clear, we are strictly nonviolent and we are not ambivalent. Today, I would update the Chinese proverb I started with to say, to know and not to use your privilege is not... To take nonviolent direct action is not to know. Find someone in the crowd with the extinction symbol, clipboard, flyers, and please visit us, visit us on our website at xrebellion.nyc to sign up for a nonviolent direct action training. Follow us on social media at xr underscore nyc, and lastly, rebel for life. Thank you. All right, um, John Steffen of the International Action Center. If you are here, please check in on stage right with one of our co-chairs. Thank you very much. Next, next up, we have Kai uh, Prixler from the Answer Coalition that acts now to stop war and end racism. Let's give it up for Kai. Sisters and brothers, we are gathered here today to oppose the twin crises of climate change and global war, which certainly pose an existential threat to humanity. But we must also recognize that these two issues are inextricably linked by the same underlying cause, a system that bases all production and human activity on profit. War and climate change are symptoms of capitalism and one simply follows the other in the pursuit of endless profit. Donald Trump seeks to overturn the Bolivarian Revolution, which yes, opposes US hegemony in Latin America, but the US isn't there just to plant a flag. They want to overturn the environmental, social, and economic protections created by the Bolivarian Revolution and turn the Venezuelan population into debt peons and slave laborers for U.S. corporations to exploit. They want to privatize every natural sanctuary, every blade of grass in Venezuela, and sell it 
to Chevron and Monsanto to destroy the land just like they're doing in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil under the fascist president Jair Bolsonaro. So when Donald Trump, Mike Pompeo, or any other war criminal comes to you and asks you to join the war against Venezuela, Iran, or North Korea, you gotta tell them, no Venezuelan ever evicted me. No Iranian ever denied my health insurance claim and forced me into medical bankruptcy. No Korean ever shot my brother dead in the street. So we reject your racist war propaganda. The poor people of the United States have no interest killing other poor people overseas. The only war that the working class in the United States should be engaged in is the war against the ultra-rich parasites right here in the financial district of New York City. Some pretty powerful stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, so sadly today, uh, Brother Cornell West could not be with us. However, uh, he has released a statement. I stand deep in solidarity with my courageous brothers and sisters in the People's Mob who fight gallantly against uh, the imperialist policies of the U.S. Empire that violates international law denies impending ecological catastrophe and promotes white supremacist practice here and abroad. Martin Luther King Jr. rightly focused on the intimate connection to militarism, capitalism, and dehumanizing ideologies of any sort. Let us stand together and fight in these grim times. All right, so give it up for Cornell West. All right, Ben's back for another tune. Welcome him. Hey, I see, a, I, see, I see a lot of socialists out there. This is a song for all of you. It's called Let's Build a Socialist System. I hope you'll sing along. We are seven billion people. We all have hopes and dreams. All of us live under a capitalist regime. Some can make a killing, others just get killed. But we don't have to live like this, there's an alternative to build. Let's build a socialist system, make the dream come alive. We need a socialist system for the people to survive. Socialize the profits to help the people thrive. We need a socialist system for the people to survive. Seven billion people, how can we all succeed? Not by competition for the basic things we need. Not by exploitation of our dwindling natural wealth. We need a system that promotes cooperation and health. Let's build it, build a socialist system. Make, make the dream come alive. We need, we need a socialist system for the people to survive. Socialize, socialize the profits to help the people thrive. We need a socialist system for the people to survive. Socialism means institutions based on care for everybody living and for the planet.
planet that we share Confronting every oppression in the places where they live Ensuring justice in the ways that people take and people give Let's build a socialist system, make, make the dream come alive We need, we need a socialist system for the people to survive Socialize, socialize the profits to help the people thrive We need a socialist system for the people to survive the dream of socialism is rooted in the heart and taking political power is an essential part the rich will surely fight to maintain the wealth they stole so we need organization to reach the socialist goal let's build it build a socialist system make the dream come alive a socialist system for the people to survive socialize socialize the profits to help the people thrive we need a socialist system for the people to survive we need we need a socialist system for the people to survive my name is Ben Grosskopf and my organization, People's Music Network, is having a gathering right here in New York City at the People's Forum, West 37th Street, October 20th. It's Sunday, October 20th. Hope you can be part of our, uh, our, our movement of musicians who are using music in the struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. We have uh, some more speakers and some music, and then we're going to march. Um, but I'm going to do a very important announcement right now. As you know, our government is threatening war with Iran. As you know, the government leaders from countries around the world will be gathering here this week for the UN General Assembly. Many of them will join us at the community church tomorrow. The people representing governments that have been under attack from the United States and have been sanctioned by the United States. Sanctions are an act of war and we cannot stand for it. For the anti-war movement to continue to grow and eventually stop this tar terror and horror from our own government around the world, we need your help. I'm going to pass around a bucket and I urge you to put in what you can this rally, even this stage, cost a lot of money. There's people that have come from far and wide. We will continue on pennies if we have to, because we have to continue. But everything you can give will help. So please do so. Thank you. Everybody's still doing all right. We have still many incredible speakers. Next, we have Joe Jameson. He's a member of the Executive Committee of the U.S. Peace Council, and he is chair of the Queens New York Peace Council. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, in July, I spent a week in Caracas. I saw up close the lawlessness of U.S. foreign policy that the people of Latin America see every day. On my second day in Caracas, by aircraft, by satellite, we don't know, the U.S. Set, sent an electronic impulse that shut down the electric power and water supply system all over Venezuela for several days. It was sheer, unprovoked, brazen gangsterism. But U.S. gangsterism goes beyond Venezuela and beyond cyber warfare. 30 countries are under illegal U.S. economic sanctions. It's as if the U.S. is waging economic war on much of the world against any country that steps out of line. But it's worse than economic warfare. The gangsterism of the U.S. war machine rages on in endless, bloody, real wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, 
Syria, Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia, and who knows how many other African countries. But the threat's even worse than all the wars of intervention. The monster John Bolton is gone, but other monsters like him remain in power. On my worst days, I fear the monsters are doing their best to ignite World War III. And the gangsterism is bipartisan. The war on Yugoslavia, Democrat Clinton. The war on Iraq and Afghanistan, Republican Bush. The war on Syria and Libya, Democrat Obama. The war on Venezuela and Iran, Republican Trump. The Democratic Party just excluded its only anti-war candidate from the presidential debates. Both major parties just passed the Pentagon budget upwards of $700 billion. Older cities in the Northeast and Midwest can no longer provide clean water, clean drinking water, but there's always more money for an F-35 or another aircraft carrier. The U.S. is a rogue state on a rampage. It's dismantling the whole architecture of nuclear arms control. It pulled out of the INF Treaty a few months ago. It's planning to pull out of the Strategic Arms Treaty in a couple of months. The U.S. unlawfully ripped up the Iran nuclear deal and now we're on the brink of war with Iran. The U.S. organizes regime change coups. It installs puppet governments. It assassinates foreign leaders. It launches drone attacks that slaughter villages. It's tightening the blockades of Venezuela and Cuba. It's maintaining 800 bases that encircle and pollute the planet. It's militarizing outer space. It's staging endless provocations from seizing oil tankers in the Persian Gulf to pushing the NATO war alliance to the borders of Russia to ginning up a new nuclear arms race. I close with this. In a few minutes, I suspect, we're going to march across town to the UN. It took a world war from 1939 to 1945 and 50 million dead to create that UN institution on the east side and its charter and the modern system of international law. The goal of the UN was to ensure that never again would there be another world war. This is the time of year when world leaders come to New York. There is no better time to the, for the world to hear from us, the U.S. people, that we regard our own government as the worst lawbreaker on earth. The governments gathered here in Manhattan, however, can only play defense against the growing lawlessness of the United States. The only force that can end the U.S. war on the world is a mobilized U.S. people, and we don't have much time. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. It was so important for you to bring up the issue of sanctions, U.S. unilateral coercive measures that have targeted Venezuela. I, I also have spent time in, in Venezuela this year and, and just returned from a trip to Syria, another country that, while is in the process of winding its military confrontation with uh, outside uh, foreign-backed extremist groups, is winding to a close. Now the United States is actually ramping up an economic war against the country. And people there were telling me that the most important message that I could communicate to the people of the United States, it's something that Venezuelans would tell me as well, is that we have to understand that sanctions are a form of economic warfare. And so if we're going to talk about building a modern anti-war movement, we should stress the, the depravity of US sanctions. The criminality, what did I say? <laughs> and criminality, yes. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point before I introduced Margaret Kimberly. She's a member of the Administrative Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. She's also a leader of the Black Alliance for Peace and senior columnist at the Black Agenda Report. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Yes. It got a little sideways. Thank you so much. Power to the people. Power to the people. I'm so pleased to be here on behalf of UNEC, 
the United National Anti-War Coalition. At UNAC, we fight to stop the wars at home and abroad. And you have to fight both. We're not going to have a country that has justice at home and aggression abroad. That is a fantasy. We must fight for both. We must fight for justice here, and we must fight to have a peaceful world, to have a country that gives up imperialism and aggression. It's important to say this now, as we're in the midst of a presidential campaign, and it's tempting, it's very tempting to want I got it, it's good. It's very tempting to hope that we can have a compromise candidate, that we can elect someone who will give us what we need and want at home and also be peaceful around the world. But that is being on a fool's errand. It isn't going to happen. We must be fighting for a new political system. We've already seen candidates who we may like, they may say something that we support, but then they turn around and call the elected president of Venezuela a dictator. When Trump continues his sanctions against Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Iran, sanctions that kill people, sanctions that are a war crime, who speaks up? Who in Congress? From which party? None of them do only we do and it's so important that we remember and that we not be taken in by the argument of lesser evilism there is no lesser evilism that doctrine is discredited and only gets us more evil there are so many ways in which we can become confused if we are not discerning for example the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. This week he was in the news because more than once he's appeared in blackface. Now that's a legitimate news story, but let me remind you about what Canada does. Canada is the junior partner in crime to the United States. Canada joins in the attack on Venezuela. Canada supports neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Trudeau is building pipelines against the wishes of the Canadian people. So you should have already disliked Justin Trudeau. You should have been like me and not spent any more mental energy because you should have known him for what he is. So it's very important that we discern. We have to discern in the environmental crisis. And we can't allow the media, we can't allow the elites to put heroes, create heroes in front of us, to have mascots. And it's all right, I'm sure the young Swedish lady's a nice kid, I'm sure she is. But she met with Barack Obama, and they had a little photo op, and they said they were friends. And I said to myself, I guess no one told her that he bragged about increasing fossil fuel production. I guess no one told her that the last climate agreement actually lets the world's temperature go up. So let's not be taken in. Let's be unafraid to be truthful about what we need. We need peace in this country. We need peace around the world. We need to survive. We need our planet to survive. All of these things are tied together. All of these things are connected. And we, in order to get any of them, we have to get all of them. And that is possible. It's up to us. Thank you so much. And I think my, my time is up, but I want to announce that UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition, will be holding its next conference here in New York in February, February 21st through 23rd. It will be at the People's Forum. Take a look at our website, unacpeace.org, for updates. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Margaret, for telling it like it is, as always. She's got one of the best Twitter accounts out there. It's true.
Next, I want to introduce the International Action Center. We have John Steffian and crew, no? Hi, everyone. Uh, I, I want to thank all of the organizers for pulling together such an important event today. As the issue of climate change becomes more pressing in the minds of the people, it's necessary for the anti-war movement to take advantage of the situation and call out the role of the U.S. War, war machine, the number one polluter in the world, in driving global warming. We need to make awareness of the carnage wrought by the U.S. military just as popular as climate change. At the same time, we need to raise awareness of the military's multiple functions. It's true that we need to focus on war and acts of aggression. We need to demand hands off Syria, hands off Iran, hands off Venezuela, hands off the DPRK. But we also need to demand the closure of all U.S. bases around the world, even in places where we aren't in an official war. And it's here that I want to bring up the role of the U.S. military in Africa. As far as I know, we are not officially at war with any nations in Africa, and yet the U.S. has over 30 bases and even more ongoing operations on the African continent. Why is this? It's to secure the resources that the U.S. needs to fuel the imperial machine. And if somehow the U.S. does decide to shift to something like a Green New Deal, how will we make sure that it's not an imperialist Green New Deal? Where will the minerals for new green technology like cobalt and nickel come from? They'll come from the Congo. They'll come from Guatemala and other green resource rich nations in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And access to these resources will be secured by the US not to bring a new green new deal for those nations and the world, but to save its own profit system unless we have a say. And that's why it's so important that the anti-war movement take up the climate change issue. Our movements for climate justice in the Imperial Center must be internationalist. So let's continue to build international solidarity in our climate change movement. We can do it. We can do it as the people of the world. Thank you. doing? Great. Next up, I would like to introduce an environmentalist and peace activist of 40 years, Madeline Hoffman from March on the Pentagon. All right, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to see everybody out here today. I'm so happy to know that there are many people who are anti-imperialist, anti-war, pro-peace, and pro-environment. And you put them all together, you have to have socialism, and you have to be against capitalism, because capitalism and the environment and capitalism and war go hand, uh, capitalism and a clean environment do not go hand in hand, and capitalism and war do go hand in hand. And we've seen an example of it just this week, Friday. There were millions of people out in the streets, and rightfully so, to combat climate change. But later that night on Friday into Saturday morning, it was announced that the U.S. was sending troops to Saudi Arabia, perhaps in preparation for this war on Iran that they've been drumming up for months and months and months. And were there people in the streets? No. And was there a message? There was a message uh, at the, um, the, the mobilization here in New York that linked climate change and war together, but there wasn't one that was coming from the masses of people the day after these large climate change um, uh, mobilizations around the world. And I have just a little anecdote from, you know, so many people are on social media these days. There was a person in New Brunswick who had a sign, two people, and the sign was, 
U.S. military is the world's largest polluter, and then said, imperialism is a climate crisis. And I posted that, that on my page within 24 hours, more than 100 likes and more than 70 shares. So clearly there are people out there who are making the connection between what the U.S. military is doing and the climate crisis. And if, you, if I had to, to illustrate it, I would say climate crisis equals war equals climate crisis equals war, and it's an endless loop. And it's also an endless loop with capitalism and imperialism. And if we don't stop that, we will not protect the people of this planet, and we will not protect the planet itself. And so I'm here tonight, today representing the March, Women's March on the Pentagon, Rage Against the, uh, against the Anti-War Machine, against the war machine, sorry, not anti-war machine, become the anti-war machine, right? Um, I'm with them because they have taken the position that we all have to take, I think, that both political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, are pro-war, pro-imperialist, and pro-capitalist. And if we keep electing the lesser of those two evils, we're still going to get the evil of war. And we, until we understand that Joe Biden, for example, has never been against a war, why, if we are anti-war, are we going to waste our vote to vote for somebody who's pro-war? We have to start acting politically and electorally as if our lives depend on it, and they do, and they have to reflect our anti-war, pro-environment uh, uh, point of view linked together. Now, we don't, the problem isn't making the case that the anti-war and anti-climate change are linked together. That's not the problem. The problem is somehow bringing these movements together, continuing to work to bring these movements together and to come down uh, to, to, so that the people who are combating climate change understand that war only exacerbates and continues, perpetuates climate change. And the other thing I just want to say when we talk about Saudi Arabia and backing and helping Saudi Arabia, let's not forget Yemen. Uh, the climate crisis there has created problems of famine. The war that's, that Saudi Arabia is waging with U.S. support is making that worse. Millions of young people in Yemen are either on the brink of starvation or have already starved to death. And the United States' hands are all over that. And we must stop that war. We must stop all the wars. We must hold the United States accountable. Uh, we do uh, with, our vo with our voice and our vote. And we have to have international accountability for the United States and its lawless actions. And the last thing I'm going to say is that the March on the Pentagon has its event, Rage Against the War Machine, October 11th and October 12th in Washington, D.C. This is Cindy Sheehan's organization. Um, we need to build off today, and that, which builds off Friday and Saturday, we need to build off today and be down in, uh, in Washington on October 11th and October 12th for the Anti-Imperialism Revolutionary Summit. And that together we can make a change to all of this that we see going on around us every day. Thank you very much. Oh, and my name is Madeline Hoffman, but I didn't say that because my <laughs> I was introduced that way. Thank you. Uh, so before we uh, I introduce the next guest speaker, I want to do another chant. Uh, so if everyone can repeat after me, we need system change, not climate change. We need system change, not climate change. Great. Uh, next up, I would like to introduce Rosa Soft from Code Pink. Rosa Soft is an anti-Zionist American-Israeli organizer from Code Pink. 
Before working with Code Pink, most of her work has been with the boycott, dis, uh, disinve uh, disinvestment, and sanctions movement, and the Palestinian Solidarity Movement. So if Rose can come up here, that would be great. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here today. Um, like was said, my name is Rose, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here today from Code Pink. And I'm going to be very brief, because I know that we all want to get marching to the UN, but before any of us continue, I think it's important we all take a moment of silence to mourn the people who were uh, murdered in Afghanistan by a US drone strike this week. There were um, 30 to 70 farmers who were killed by a U.S. drone strike. The U.S. said that they were trying to kill ISIS. They ended up killing 70 civilians. Uh, and this is not anything new. As we know, this isn't a Trump problem. This is an America problem. Obama had 542 drone strikes during his tenure and murdered almost 4,000 people. And I don't need to tell everybody here today that this is U.S. empire. And as long as the U.S. empire stands, it's not a question of left and right. It's a question of top and bottom. And where is the power? With us, with the people. So before we march, I would just like all of us to take a moment of silence for the 70 people who lost their lives this week from U.S. imperialism and U.S. militarism. Because we are doing this for them, we are doing this for a world that works for everybody, where nobody profits off of death and destruction. So if we could just take a few moments. Thank you so much. Um, so next up, I would like to uh, introduce uh, from Okinawa Solidarity, Takio Johanna Tersi. Takio was born and raised in Nagio City, Okinawa. She's a survivor of the Battle of Okinawa, uh, active for Stand with Okinawa and Peace for Okinawa, uh, Okinawa Coalition. Early this year, she made a speech in front of the White House for an immediate halt of the landfill work in Hanako. Thank you. Please come up. Konnichiwa. Good afternoon, y'all. Okay, what I did. All right. Anybody heard of a name of the island called Okinawa? You have? Karate Kid. Okay, that's it. I don't have to go any further than that. It's about three and a half hours from Tokyo to the southern part of Okinawa, close to Taiwan. Okay, my first English alphabet was B, A, B, C, B, not that B, B as in B29. I was, tw uh, I was three and a half years old when I first heard that. And then all the World War II related terminologies, such as bombing, uh, tanks, uh, all this, I don't want to even, don't want to even remember that. My first name is Teiko, like a Seiko watch, as a T, as in Tom. And uh, when a taxi driver in Okinawa in August, I just visited there, uh, he said he used to own the uh, tourism company, but he had to close it down after the, uh, uh, the World Trade Center was attacked because there was no business after that. So he was driving, that's what he was talking about. His, so all the way from Pacific Ocean to the other side, the World Trade, the big horrible news was effective. Even taxi driver on the island. I'm concerned for the welfare of Okinawa and its people. My citizenship is American, but my cultural identity stems from my homeland, Okinawa. We have a unique culture, language, and pride, but both Japanese 
and the American governments keep ignoring and suppressing Okinawa. My name is Teiko Tursi. Tursi is Italian, but Teiko is my first name. Te Yonaha is my maiden name. I'm from Nago City, Okinawa. I moved to USA 60, 1964. Since then, I have learned about American values, the right to be safe, strong, and free. Believe it or not, I've learned this in this country, especially in this state, against the wishes of 72% of Okinawan voters in a February referendum, the Japanese government is moving forward with the construction of a new military base in Henoko Bay. The government is ignoring and suppressing Okinawan's de democratic will using the typical justification of NIMBY, not in my backyard. Typical. Who have, we have a right to protect our dignity, lands, oceans, skies, descendants, and the spirit of our ancestors. We need to share our Ryukyu young history. We must share our culture, peace, and justice with the future generations. Japan's population has a ratio of almost 90, 90 Japanese to one Okinawan. And Japan's land mass is over 243 times larger than Okinawa's, Okinawa's smaller than Rhode Island, 70% of the Rhode Island, whereas Japan is close to the size of California. Now you picture that. Yet, over 70% of the U.S. bases in Japan are in Okinawa. Thank you. This is unjustifiable. Most Japanese citizens do not, do, don't know about this situation. Some of them don't care or indifferent. The Futema is the dang most dangerous base in the world. Construction in Henoko Bay. Henoko Bay, that's... You see the orange, orange sections? That's where, this is, a, this is Okinawa, 70% of Rhode Island. But the orange part is the US bases, Marines, armies, all four uh, branches. And uh, uh, the Dense military presence in Okinawa causes many Colorado problems. Believe me, we have lots of problems there. This is a serious and disturbing problem, at, and it's not only a Japanese domestic issue, the U.S. also contributes. So Okinawans confront two colonizers. Thank you for understanding this. What I'm my English is good enough for you? Okay. Thank you. The Battle of Okinawa ended in June 1945. I was a four. Instead of surrendering, my father took his own life, just like his commander who was in charge of Okinawa, Mitsui, his name Mitsuru Ushijima. Whereas my mother with her children hid in mountain caves to avoid B-29 bombings and the soldiers from both the U.S. and the Japanese. Okinawan didn't ask for war. My mother chose Nuchidu Takara. Life is a treasure. Right. Meet, which means life is a treasure, yes. She did not believe in committing suicide for honor, as many people did. Up to a third of Okinawans died in the ba battle. I heard that it's more than uh, put Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together. 
my father gave my mother a hand grenade, which she kept in her handbag. Always hungry, I thought that it was a sweet potato. <laughs> my, my mother was strong and self-reliant because of her determination. Her descendants now over 60. The hand grenade, that's what, how people did it. Put them in the middle and hover over one hand grenade and just blow up. That's what the, uh, still to this day, all these bones and everything remains found in the caves in the, right under the big tree roots. That's what Okinawan war was. You're all talking about future war. I'm talking about the, the battle of Okinawa. I know what I'm talking about. I couldn't see the fireworks for a while because I thought that was B-29. But I was able to go to school, so I didn't get into the uh, uh, PTSD. Okinawa was a war prize given to America by Japan. How convenient for Japan to exploit Okinawa for the defense of the main mainland. This is a racial and ethnic discrimination. In 1879, Japan annexed the Ryukyu Islands. Soon, the traditional Ryukyu young culture, such as karate, sanshin, dance, native languages, etc., were suppressed. If we spoke our regional native tongues, we were punished by having a big wooden tag called Hogen Fuda hang around the neck, which means, you know, direct. So we had to speak Japanese. I have experienced this humiliation and I remember very well that no one advocated for us children. Later, I learned that these manipulations were for brainwashing the islanders. This is called learned helplessness. Some don't even know what went on, what's going on still to this day. In our textbooks, there was nothing printed about the history of the Rikyu. We were kept in the dark about own past. We must listen to what Okinawan has to say, listen to the Okinawan voices of Okinawan people. Okinawan's self-determination should be accepted by both Japanese and the U.S. government because we all have the right to be safe, strong, and free. Thank you. Hi everyone. So we will be marching in 20 minutes, uh, but before that, Ben will be doing another song and we have a couple more speakers, so go for it, Ben. Brothers and sisters, this is my last song up here. My name is Ben Grosscup from Greenfield, Massachusetts, Executive Director of People's Music Network for Songs of Freedom and Struggle. And uh, this uh, last song was first written by Phil Oakes in 1965. It's called Love Me, I'm a Liberal. And uh, this is my effort to keep this song current for today. I mourned the Tiananmen martyrs whose free speech was so brutally quelled. And I cheered when Mandela walked freely after so many years in a cell. But Mr. Assange can rot in prison those secrets were not his to tell so love me love me love me i'm a liberal i attend sensitivity trainings and i leave feeling so reassured I love Oprah and Magic and Foreman. It's great seeing blacks become entrepreneurs. The economy's become so inclusive. Revolution would just be absurd. So love me, love me, love me. I'm a liberal.
I cheered when Obama was chosen, my faith in the system restored. And I'll never forgive Ralph Nader for the race he stole from Al Gore. And I love hardworking Latinos as long as they don't move next door. So love me, love me, love me, I'm a liberal. Something happened to working class voters. They've disgraced America's name. Someone's controlling the way that their minds work. And Vladimir Putin's the man who's to blame. But if you think you can win single payer, you must be completely insane. So love me, love me, love me. I'm a liberal. I listen to all things considered. I'd consider anyone's views. I watch Colbert and Rachel Maddow. I use irony in everything I do. But when Trump set his sights on Maduro, there was no one more red, white, and blue. So love me, love me, love me, I'm a liberal. I vote for the Democratic Party. They're strengthening NATO command. I saw Bono at the Live Aid concert. I'd buy anything endorsed by his brand. We're gonna make poverty history. I'm on Facebook taking a stand. So love me, love me, love me. I'm a liberal. Sure, once I was young and impulsive. I wore every conceivable pin. I fought for a socialist future, which I actually thought we could win. Ah, but I've grown older and wiser, and that's why I'm turning you in. So love me, love me, love me, I'm a liberal. Thank you so much to the organizers of this event. Thank you all for being here. All right, let's give it up again for the very talented Ben Roscoff. All right, next up we have from the People's Power Assembly, uh, Makasi Motema. Uh, so he is a racial justice organizer and leader with the People's Power Assemblies dedicated to prison abolition, abolition of the police and ICE, and ending the war on the poor. He is dedicated to full revolution against capitalism and white supremacy. Let's give it up for Makasi. We know what drives U.S. imperialism. Profits, wealth, the unquenchable thirst for new markets to exploit. As long as they're in power, the capitalist ruling class will never quench their thirst for blood and oil. But they tell us that they fight for human rights, that they occupy nations to bring freedom, that they drop bombs to save lives. We know the truth. We know that the U.S. can't fight a war on terrorism when the U.S. is the number one source of terrorism on this planet. 
Who has toppled more governments than the United States? Who has killed more civilians than the United States? And U.S. crimes are not limited to wars abroad. In fact, U.S. terrorism abroad looks a lot like police terrorism at home. In the hands of the police, U.S. weapons of war gun down black bodies in the streets. U.S. prison guards torture innocent souls from Abu Ghraib to Rikers Island. Our borders are hardened with military equipment. The crossing in El Paso looks much like an operating base in Kandahar. Both here and there, the free movement of innocent people is obstructed by white supremacists in uniform. They try to deny our humanity as they degrade their own. But U.S. imperialism will not last forever. The farther they project their strength, the weaker they become. When empires expand too far, they collapse. We will defeat U.S. imperialism. The wars will end. Imperialism will fall when capitalism falls. Capitalism will fall when the people rise up. And we will rise up. We will stand up and fight. We will fight interventionism with solidarity. We will fight imperialism with direct action. We will fight capitalism with socialism. We will fight the ruling class with the power of the masses. And when we do, the imperialists will understand that the power of the people united may never be defeated. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. All right, our next guest is an outspoken defender of Palestinian rights. He is someone who has spoken out in defense of the Venezuelan people as they face an unprecedented economic war waged by the United States. He's also sent very strong messages of support for Julian Assange, the jailed Yes, everybody should give a round of applause to Julian Assange. And you'll want to keep clapping as we introduce Roger Waters, Pink Floyd bassist. Wow. Hey guys. Yeah, when I, I got the call from Margaret Flowers to come here this afternoon and be part of this. Um, yeah, I thought to myself, uh, when did I last go to a political meeting? Because um, meetings I'm not really very good at, by and large. I'm quite good at standing on stages and uh, singing songs and... Um, and I, and I find that much easier. I thought, well, when was the last time I went to a political meeting? And I figured out that it was in 1961 when I marched from Aldermaston to Trafalgar Square in London and listened to Bertram Russell and Canon Collins speaking against um, nuclear arms. 
Uh, that is a battle that we're still fighting. Um, whether we'll come to a good or a bad conclusion to that story remains to be seen. Anyway, then a week ago, I stood on a small stage like this with John Pilger, the great um, journalist, and sang a song for Julian Assange, who is imprisoned in Belmarsh Prison as we speak, uh, waiting to complete his um, short sentence for a bail infringement uh, before the appalling, apocryphal Boris Johnson can pack him off to America so that the American government can get rid of him finally once and for all, which is, I'm sure, which is what their intention is. So we, <clears throat> we all have to make as much noise as we possibly can in defense of Julian Assange, a great human being and a great journalist. I, I never forget Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning, as we know, is also incarcerated at the time being because she quite rightly but very bravely refused to give evidence to a closed grand jury trying to uh, manufacture the evidence that they need to incarcerate Julian Assange for the remainder of what will be a very short life, I have no doubt, if they get their way. Um, <clears throat> so when I was coming down here I thought I'm going to be standing in the street with uh, peace activists from both uh, the climate perspective and also from the anti-war uh, perspective and I'm very proud and honoured to be standing here with all of you today. <clears throat> and this piece of paper, Christ I sound like Neville Chamberlain. And <clears throat> I have in my hand a piece of paper signed by the German Chancellor. Anyway, we won't go down that road. Um, this is a poem that I wrote in 2004, just before the re-election of the appalling G.W. Bush to your presidency. Um, so, and it's called why cannot the good prevail? And I'm glad I brought this with me uh, because I sense that it may mean quite a lot, quite a lot of you here. Because you are the good. And why you are not pre prevailing is a very open and important question which I address here. We need a lot more, we, we need somehow to start communicating uh, with the younger generation who I see wandering down on the pavement looking slightly glazed and fiddling with their iPhones and thinking, what are those people doing over there, you know? Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. This is what I wrote in 2004. So when there's a, a reference somewhere to a Texan dynasty, you will know who it was I was talking about. Why cannot the good prevail? Here, in America, there is at heart a people just and true, open, sometimes to the point of ridicule, good neighbors to rebuild the barn, the doctor's note of Western legend carried forth beyond the grave. I knew your pa enough. In caucuses across the land, deliberate they'll always stand, defenders of the Rosenbergs, symbolic of that yearning to be better than before. They never will give up their brother to the grocer's cold machine. Belt welts, livid from the strong arm of the law. On campuses, in boardrooms over giving thanks and pumpkin pie, on hustings in committee rooms, whenever tyrants loomed, we always held in our esteem the ones who hold on to the dream unflinching while the bullies pose and fiddle on the hill. Has commerce so reduced the free that blinded like a tot, contaminated by the dog shit in the grass, we blunder slaves to humbug and this Texan dynasty? 
No. Beyond the grip of trade, the young strain beautiful and proud. The hoarfrost breath of new blood needs but nudges from the old forgotten guard to scale the moral high grounds in the clouds. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. And thank you all for coming here today. And the fight goes on. All right, Roger Waters, everyone. Okay, all right, let's see. Our next speaker is Roger Warham of the December 12th Movement. So Roger Warham is a founding member of the December 12th Movement, a lifelong community activist, a former political prisoner, and an international human rights attorney. He has presented the United States human rights violations against black people to the United Nations Human Rights Mechanism in Geneva since 1989. Let's give it up for Roger. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. U.S. hands off Zimbabwe. Lift the sanctions now. Listen carefully. Three U.S. presidents have said the following. Zimbabwe constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to the foreign policy of the United States. They've said that with a straight face, and they've used that as a justification to impose sanctions on Zimbabwe. What has Zimbabwe done to deserve that punishment? Zimbabwe lone and first of all African countries, had the temerity to defy precedent and return the land that was stolen from them by white colonizers to the indigenous people. And that is what is perceived as a threat to the United States foreign policy, which means that the United States foreign policy is a policy of colonialism neo-colonialism and white supremacy. So we're here today as a member of the December 12th movement to say very simply and also as a follower of Malcolm X who understood the importance of pan-Africanism in the, the liberation of African people in the diaspora and on the African continent to say very simply that Zimbabwe will not submit to the strategy of regime change. The United States passed a bill in 2001, co-sponsored by Jesse Helms, and I can see by the gray hairs on people here, they know who Jesse Helms was in terms of an unrepentant cracker. And Hillary Clinton, it was called the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act, and it imposed sanctions on Zimbabwe until the President of the United States decided that democracy would be restored in Zimbabwe. And since that time, sanctions uh, as, a, as a weapon of war have been imposed on Zimbabwe to make the economy scream in an attempt to get the masses of the people of Zimbabwe to rise up against the government, against ZANU-PF, and return Zimbabwe to actually Rhodesia, very similar to Make America Great Again. So I leave you today with one thought. Lift the sanctions now. Lift the sanctions now. U.S. hands off Zimbabwe. Thank you. All right. Okay, next up we have Zaid Mohammed from the People's Organization for Progress and the Malcolm X uh, Commemoration Committee. Right on. All power to the people, everyone. All power to the people. I bring you revolutionary greetings from the Soprano State 
the state that was one of the defining moles of gangsterism, the toxic dump state, the swamp monster state, the state so racist they couldn't even vote for Abraham Lincoln either time, the state of New Jersey, right? Don't boo the people, boo the gangsters, boo the racists, boo the toxic dumpers, boo the monsters, but salute the people. Because I stand in and say that wherever we are, wherever the people are, there is resistance. Wherever we be, there is resistance. We resist any cause for putting troops on the ground in Yemen. We resist any cause for a war against Iran. We resist any sanctions and attacks on Venezuela. We resist and we oppose the continued uh, 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 sanctions on Cuba. We resist. War machine, wherever we find it, wherever it finds itself, we resist the genocide of the Palestinian people. We resist the continued imprisonment of our political prisoners. Let us not forget Mumi Abu Jamal. Let us not forget uh, 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 Jaleel Mutakim right here, been locked up for 48 years. Let us uh, not forget uh, Ed Poindexter, been locked up for 49 years. Let us not forget Sunni al -Akoli. Let us not forget those who stood up with my faith and by something else against the war machine here killing our people in the street. Let us not forget any of that. And wherever we rise, we need to rise together. Solidarity now, solidarity ever, forward ever, backwards never, all power to the people. We'll see you in the world. Some powerful words, huh? All right, continuing on. We have Chairman Omali uh, Yashilta from the ba Black is Back Coalition. Omali Yashilta is Chairman of the African People's Socialist Party USA and the African Socialist International, the leading force organizing the struggle to unify Africa and African people everywhere. Chairman Omali is the founder of the Burning Spear newspaper and theburningspear.com. Let's give it up. Uhuru! Uhuru! I want to greet you with the words Uhuru. The word Uhuru, it was a slogan demand that was made popular by the Kenyan Land Freedom Army, commonly known as Mau Mau. It was the Kenyan Land Freedom Army that fought the British Empire for scores for tens of years to push the British out of Kenya. And we think it's important because as a slogan, as a demand, Uhuru, Uhuru, the word freedom, terrorized the colonial masters in Kenya and around the world. And so what we do is we use the slogan demand Uhuru because it's extremely important to us and we believe that Uhuru of freedom should be on the minds of African people 24 hours a day. Uhuru! Uhuru! Comrades, brothers and sisters, as it was stated, I am the chair of the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. We are an organization that will, on November 2nd and 3rd in Washington, D.C., be holding a march and a conference against war and for peace, but under the slogan, turn imperialist wars into wars against imperialism. <laughs> because we have come to understand some time ago that war is a natural consequence of imperialism. You can't have imperialism without war. You have war, whether it's a Kennedy war, whether it's an Obama war, whether it's a Trump war, you're gonna have war as long as imperialism exists. And there are some of us who have concluded that while it is good to protest every violation of the peace, every terroristic act that is imposed on the people here and around the world, that our responsibility is greater than that. Our responsibility is to organize and overthrow imperialism to make revolution right here. Our responsibility 
is to follow the edict of Che Guevara when he looked at the Vietnamese people struggling against U.S. imperialism and he saw that as an example of what the oppressed peoples around the world must do. He didn't say bring the boys home. He said two, three, many Vietnams. The oppressed people have to engage this monster and bring it to his knees. And that's our responsibility in this country more than any place on the planet Earth. We're not going to be able to sing it into a cessation of the action that is making against the people. I want to say that. I also want to say that the Black is Back Coalition, which is the oldest African anti-war organization in this country, held the first demonstration, national demonstration against Obama, had the first national demonstration at the White House when the Obama regime came into office because we knew that imperialism, whatever complexion it comes in, is imperialism. And that Obama is an enemy to the people just like Trump is an enemy to the people. And Obama in so many ways was much more insidious than Trump. Everybody recognizes what Trump is, but Obama used his black skin, the color of the oppressed, to represent the oppressor and that was a traitorous act that he made against oppressed peoples around the world and certainly to African people. So, I think it's also important for us to say that one of the reasons we have to be here today is because we are experiencing a, an imperialism, a social system in a state of crisis. We see perpetual acts of war not because of the strength of U.S. imperialism, but because of its weakness. It is frantic. And why is it frantic? Because the capitalist system itself was built on a foundation of slavery and colonialism. Black people were first capital. We were commodities and capital. And this is the, this is the real fault line of this social system. The Black is Black Coalition felt like it was necessary to come into existence because many of the wars that have to be fought have to be fought against are happening below the radar of the traditional so-called anti-war, so-called peace movement. Because when we look at how this social system came into existence, we're talking about a war that started with the indigenous people in this country who don't even get mentioned unless they're in the room. But it's this country, this land, that was stolen from the indigenous people that became a part of the foundation of the capitalist system that Karl Marx re re referred to as the primitive accumulation of capital that started the entire thing off. We had to come into existence because we want to make war. We want to take on this war that's been made against these people in these concentration camps that are euphemistically referred to as Indian reservations. It's important for us to be here because this imperialism that in its founding is responsible for my presence here. African people are not indigenous to this land. Somebody came to Africa and initiated a war on Africa 600 years ago in 1415 when the Portuguese came there, attacked Africa, and began to disperse Africans at gunpoint all around the world. It was they who made this assault on the African nation. That's why we have to talk about Sunniata Koli being locked up in a prison right here in this country. Sunniata was fighting against the imperial war that's been going on for 600 years. And we are calling on our comrades everywhere to join in this to struggle to defeat that war that has been imposed on us. Their willingness to stop and stand in front of a tank to keep it from going to El Salvador or to keep it from going to Afghanistan. We think that's wonderful. But police cars leave every precinct in New York every damn day to come and murder and brutalize African people. We have to take a stand against that as well. That's what we are talking about. That's what we are talking about. It is a rotten, foul social system that has no redeeming qualities. 
It doesn't matter who's in office. It has no redeeming quality. It was founded as war against the indigenous people. It was built of guess, by war on African people who became the labor machine, a part of the so-called primitive accumulation that Karl Marx talked about. Revolution is the way forward. And I know that everybody out here is not ready to talk about revolution, but whether you are or not is coming. It has to come. It has to come. Because the people will never know peace on the planet Earth as long as capitalism, which was born of slavery, which was born of genocide, continues to exist. So I wanted to say this as a leadership of the Black is Black Coalition and the African People's Socialist Party, that African people around the world suffer mightily. And it didn't start here in this country. It started 600 years ago when Portugal attacked us. And African people all over the world today are suffering. We suffer in Haiti. We suffer in Jamaica. We suffer in Houston, Texas. We suffer in Ghana. We suffer in South Africa. We suffer in Sierra Leone. Every place black people are, we are suffering as a consequence of that attack on Africa. And we have come to understand that it's going to take revolution to extricate ourselves from the grip of this incredibly cruel monster. U.S. imperialism is the worst imperialism that's ever existed on the planet Earth, and the people will only know free, no peace, when we rise up and, and destroy imperialism. Revolution is the only way. We are going to have to be a revolutionary organization to take imperialism off the planet Earth. You destroy imperialism, you destroy Trumpism. You destroy imperialism, you destroy Obamaism. You destroy imperialism, you destroy Macron in France and all the other thieves and pirates who are looting and raiding our people and humiliating black people all around the world. We say our power to the people, black power to the African community. I'm gonna leave you, say Uhuru! Uhuru! Thank you, Black is Back. I think it's time for a little music interlude, so I want to invite filmmaker, activist, and musician Rebel Diaz. Yes. What up, what up? Hey, real quick, I just want to, want to represent, um, I'm coming from Hunts Point in New York, and we are on the front lines of, of the battle against what's going on with this climate change, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, the reality is that we're gonna have climate refugees in the future, and those climate refugees are gonna be the poor, you know what I'm saying? And so when we look at the poor communities, those are the ones that are gonna be facing those realities head on. So I gotta represent my community in the South Bronx, um, and also my indigenous community uh, back home uh, in, in, Mapu, in, in, in Walmapu, the land of the Mapuche. Uh, in the south. I'm, I'm from Chile, but I like to uplift the indigenous movements of the Mapuche, uh, who for years, indigenous communities, since before this was even an issue, been talking about respecting Mother Earth. Um, and, and at the same time, when I talk about the Bronx, I can't talk about the Bronx and not talk about the help that Venezuela gave us. You know what I'm saying? As a nobody, nobody was even considering showing love to a hip hop community center and the Bolivarian Revolution did that. So I'm gonna start off my set with a song that we dedicated to him. And shout outs, because I met an embassy protector like five minutes before I got on stage. Um, the brave souls that, that defended that embassy in DC. This goes out for y'all. This is called Work Like Chavez. Drop that real quick. <laughs> yeah. Comandante Hugo Chavez presente. La Revolución Bolivariana presente. Yeah. Put your hands up, y'all. This is a hip hop feeling. We in New York. Here we go. Yeah, look, yo. Yo en Caracas. El proceso va pa'lante in the South Bronx. El proceso va pa'lante in New York. El proceso va pa'lante in Chicago. El proceso, look. I can't front. I'm upset that they took our building. Next thing, el comandante, man, I know they killed him. Something going on, I gotta read the signs. Something telling me that it's about that time. Time to step it up, cause I still smell sulfur Still smell money from this capitalist culture 
dedicated verses to my boy Jamil. He out there in Venezuela, front line is real. I was point New York, 2005. That's when I realized the revolution so alive. We never had a president come around my. He brought oil to the poor in the winter time. He showed love to the Bronx. That's called solidarity. We show love back. Ain't no politicians scaring me. Anti-imperialist till I go delirious. The work is getting serious. They keep fearing us through the mathematics. Hugo Chavez was the baddest. Cha-cha. We gotta work like Chavez. Through the mathematics, Hugo Chavez was the baddest. Cha-cha. We gotta work like you ain't got our gas. El proceso va pa'lante in the South Bronx. El proceso va pa'lante in Maracay. El proceso va pa'lante in Nueva York. El proceso va pa'lante. <laughs> That's a little something real quick. We we gonna be doing half the joints because I don't got my brother G1 with me. Um, hit that real quick. This yeah, this next song is a song written by Florence Reese that was organizing with the with the miners in the Appalachians. So we dedicate this to all the workers and the working class. This is called Which Side Are You On? We put our fists up like this. Let's go. Yeah. Look, see I gotta draw the line, I can't take it no more If you ain't down with revolution, what you waiting for? Making money for suckers and our communities poor Ripping flags off of coffins, man, this ain't our war Colonized and terrorized by the world's biggest killers The US government, the biggest weapon and drug dealers Filling prisons with children, incarcerating the future My space and space book, got a stuck in computers Sickle stupid, bumping music that's abusive to the shorties The dances that they spit and we just listen and absorb it I've been dormant, I've been woken, I'm a giant, I'm ready With the Alpha in Oaxaca and we hold it I rock hard like Palestinian children holding slingshots With every single kid that's down for hip hop The culture, the life, what it really stands for This music is resistance, it's the voice of the poor On the side of the workers, the teachers, and lunch ladies On the streets of brown mommies raising our brown babies I'm with youth organizers cleaning up the Bronx River Can't miss Galante when I stand and deliver I'm with Evo Morales, man, he run in Bolivia Distribution of the land so we can all live bigger I'm with Ugo and Fidel, Grandmaster of Melly Mel We the Panthers up in Queens, justice for Sean Bell We got Macho Negron, we don't care that Rios Feed up for Oscar Lopez, time to get him the bill With a boo Jamal, with a side of Shakur With the compas in the fuck, I'll be getting a penny more Which side? Sha City The South Bronx, baby with Bushwick, Con Todo Queens, Con Las Mujeres, Con Nueva York, baby. Look, look. Not one for telling the truth, exposing the lies. Think about the dead soldiers when you're driving your ride. The people die for the oil, Daddy Bush's revenge. I'm with the widow, the children, and the lonely best friends. For families staying together as one. I'm not for the raids or the deportations. We keep the total and the MIR. So watch out for them snitches in that unmarked car. If a little Saulito, we gon' fight for your moms. So we gon' shout around twice in one song. For 12 million workers in Elvira Ariano. For a world without borders and a better tomorrow. Better tomorrow. Yeah, so look, when we talk about climate, I'm over here talking about climate refugees like it's something of the future. We got that right now with folks from the Bahamas. You know what I'm saying? You, you look at Puerto Rico, what's going on with that? So we did a little remix. It's called Viva Puerto Rico Libre. And it's a remix that we did from a crew out of my area in the South Bronx called the Ghetto Brothers. You know what I'm saying? So this is a remix of that Ghetto Brothers song. And it's called Viva Puerto Rico Libre. Drop that real quick. Yeah. Para todos los que están allá, estamos acá apoyando. Center Solidarity de Puerto Rico. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Una isla en mi corazón. This yellow Benji right here. Y'all can sing along. It goes, Viva Puerto Rico Libre right here. Viva Puerto Rico Libre, we gon' get free. Let's go, y'all. Let's get it, my G. We gon' get free. Yo, I 
al pie de lucha pero estoy cansado hasta cuando aceptamos vivir como clavo no quiero vivir con miedo mía no quiero llorar por nuestra vida si no luchamos no sobrevivimos if we don't struggle we die in my people hasta cuando compañeros vamos a decir sí, siento lo que olvida la tortura al infierno yo no quiero colonización solo quiero liberación don pedro al piso lo dijo mejor no importa ser fuerte si no hay valor we must be brave united hermanos south bronx to the north for chicago bad love to la isla del encanto ghetto brothers take it out with the canto we gon' get free viva puerto rico libre let's get it my g it's time to get free We gon' get free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's up. Um. So look, I gotta share something. I feel like I'm, I'm with the fam because we're here. So on the way over here, they was talking about, you know, some of the points of what this gathering is about. And they was talking about nuclear weapons. And we gotta be clear because folks got a short memory. The only country that's ever used nuclear weapons is this country right here. They dropped on, on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And if you look at it from the, from the perspective of history, that shit might as well have been yesterday. You know what I'm saying? And so, it's not a song, it's not done, but I feel like it's cool, we should share it. The, the, the idea goes, We in the streets trying to hustle out the peace, but the government don't want to put the bombs away. Nobody's organizing, that's why the youth are dying All they gotta do is put the bombs away We in the streets trying to hustle for this peace But the government don't want to throw them bombs away Nobody's organizing, that's why the youth are dying All they gotta do is put those bombs away I'm not a singer, so most likely, you know what I mean, I guess But we gon' we gonna do that, let's drop that beat, see what it sounds like Yo, we in the streets trying to hustle out the peace, but the government don't want to put the bombs away. Nobody's organizing, that's why the youth are dying. All we gotta do is throw the bombs away. We in the streets trying to hustle out the peace, but the government don't want to put the... Hey yo, shots go off the neighborhood. Police call a young man dangerous. They banging us, we banging back. They bang the sound of us fight back. We don't want war, we want freedom. No excuses, what's your reason? Not your cattle, not your slave. Uh uh, not today. We in the streets trying to hustle out the peace. But the government don't want to put the bombs away. Nobody's organizing, that's why the youth are dying. All we gotta do is put the. Hey, we in the streets trying to fight for this peace, but the government don't want to put them. Yeah, nobody's organizing, that's why we multiplying, all they got to do is throw the... I right, cut that, cut that, man. That's a little idea. I'm going to write that and record it, and when I put it out, it's going to be for y'all. All right, I'm going to do one more and I'm out. One more and I'm out. I believe that hip-hop is, is a culture... I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Sam, I love you. I'm done. Check us out, rebeldiaz.com, we here. And hey, I want to share something before I get out. It's, it's, it, when we here, we gather, we may be small in numbers, but I'd rather rock with 200 soldiers than a thousand knuckleheads who don't know what time it is. And I've been hearing some righteous politics on the stage. You know what I'm saying? It's not no liberalism. We, if we really gonna win, we have to see the fact that we are already at war. You know what I'm saying? And if you're gonna fight, When you live historic moments of oppression, the only response is historic moments of resistance. All right, peace them out. Thank you for that performance, Rebel Diaz, and thank you for, for supplying the Embassy Protection Collective with our soundtrack when we were on the inside. Right, Kay? You know that's right. Next up, I'm going to introduce someone that I work very closely with at the Gray Zone Project. He's the senior editor of the Gray Zone Project, Max Blumenthal. Thank you, and, uh, oh, yes. and, uh, and something else. Are you ready to march? All right, I was just going to thank the organizers for making me go after Rebel Diaz. It's like a pretty hard act to follow. I'm not going to spit any rhymes, I'm just a journalist. Uh, yeah, but yeah, well, I'll, I'll do my best, you know. I am not objective. 
and neither are the journalists up in the Reuters Thompson building, at the Time Warner building, at the 30 Rock MSN MSDNC building. They're not objective either. They just, you know, they have their little blue check marks on Twitter and their suits, but really you could just basically automate them with a automatic Wall Street and war machine generation reporter bot. We wanna do something different at the Gray Zone Project. At the Gray Zone, what we're trying to do is counter one of the most sophisticated and vicious information wars being waged against the minds of the Western public to cultivate support for destructive regime change wars that destroy any independent state. And what we have done is go to the ground in these countries that have been targeted for regime change and show another side and show the people who are demonized and who are lumped in in a racist way with the official enemy dictator. So we've been this year to Nicaragua, we've been to Venezuela, we've been to, we just returned from Syria and I'm tired as hell as you can tell. And we were also in Honduras, a country where a US regime change operation succeeded. Let me talk about these countries a little bit. And, and she, she says, don't go too long. We're gonna march. But let me talk about these countries a little bit and tie it in to the climate issue. Um, you know, we're quality, not quantity here. This is like the anti-war movement. This is the woke people who've been red-pilled. You had like 250,000 people yesterday, no mention of militarism or regime change and the role that it has played in the destroying the environment. So we have to educate them. There were three countries that did not sign on to the Paris Protocol. China, you know, somebody might call them petro-populists or something. They are trying to build an economy basically from scratch and lift millions of people out of poverty into the middle class. So they didn't sign on to it. Then there's Nicaragua and Syria. Why didn't they sign on? Nicaragua and Syria, you look, look, look up you know, any report on this and you'll see, you know, Terry, uh, you'll see NPR. You know, the, the evil dictator countries did not sign on to the Paris Protocol. Nicaragua didn't sign on because Nicaragua faces the direct brunt of climate change with hurricanes every year and they considered it a band-aid solution that was too weak and the elected Sandinista government led by Daniel Ortega is putting in place some of the most advanced mechanisms for preparing their country and their population with food sovereignty, with shelter for the effects of climate change and so they didn't sign on. Then there's Syria. Syria didn't sign on. Why? Because our government spent billions of dollars to arm and train 31 flavors of Takfiri Wahhabi Contras to devastate that country and we saw what they did and talked to people who lived under their rule and they were promoted to us as moderate rebels, as freedom fighters. Syria could not implement the Paris Protocols because the state was under direct attack. So this is the issue. If you don't have independent states, states get taken over. Nicaragua, a year later, faced a regime change attempt and some of our lefty friends supported it. I don't understand why. They supported the overthrow of the Sandinista government with an opposition funded by big agro like Cargill. The Sandinistas and the Nicaraguan people resisted and they're continuing on their path to, to independence and environmental sustainability that goes well beyond what the EU and the US are willing to do. And can we not forget about Brazil where we saw another regime change operation where Lula da Silva is now in prison for a phony corruption scandal and Dilma Rousseff was ousted in a parliamentary coup and as a result, under the watch of Jair Bolsonaro, a far right proto-fascist, the Amazon, burned like it had never burned before. And I don't know what Extinction Rebellion was doing protesting the Bolivian embassy. They should have stu stuck to the Brazilian embassy. Uh, you know, get your heads right. Um, we went to Honduras too, and I'm gonna wrap up here. Because Honduras, is, it's so important that we know what's happening in that country, where a coup took out its democratically elected leader Manuel Zelaya in 2009 presided over by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton 
and installed a right-wing junta now led by someone who is accused in a New York federal court of narco trafficking, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who still, despite bringing bags of cocaine marked with his brother Tony's um, initials into the U.S., gets to come and visit Washington and meet with the Department of Homeland Security. Honduras has seen some of the worst attacks on environmental defenders, and many of you know the name Berta Caceres. We were able to go to the home that Berta Caceres was raised. We've just posted an interview that Anya conducted with Berta's mother. They are living under 24-hour police guard paid for by human rights groups. They travel around in armored cars. There are cameras around their house. They are under threat. Berta is a, from the Lenca indigenous group and defended her river and her land and went around the world denouncing not just climate change and making these empty calls to save the planet, de denouncing the effect of capitalism and regime change and the policies advanced by Hillary Clinton on her country. And she was cut down, killed in 2016 by a death squad, hired by a multinational corporation, building a hydroelectric dam in her community, a hydroelectric dam that would have never been, been possible without this regime change operation. So it's our responsibility as people who care about this planet and the people in the planet and who care about man-made disasters like the famine in Yemen caused by our government and Saudi Arabia, uh, our, our woke ally Mohammed bin Salman, it's our obligation to stand against regime change wars, phony color revolutions, and the corporate media's information war that they're waging on our minds. We have to be the teachers. We have to tell people how this is connected to the destruction of the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Max. It is our responsibility as citizens in the United States, the preeminent empire, to show solidarity with the people that are being targeted by our government, by regime change wars, economic warfare, and say that we believe in international law and the UN Charter. That's exactly what we're going to do in a few minutes when we walk. We march together to the UN. I hope everybody's ready for that. But first, I just want to introduce our final speakers, David Paul and Adrian Pine of the Embassy Protection Collective. Come on up. Hello. Um, I consider myself a concerned uh, citizen. I flew out here from California to, to uh, visit the embassy. And part, mostly because I've been disgusted for most of my life watching the United States say they're trying to promote democracy around the world and they're doing just the opposite. Regime change using violence, propaganda, militarism um, to overthrow governments and stop any efforts of self-determination in other countries. And in our experience in the embassy, they call us criminals. The real criminals are in the State Department, the White House, a lot of these buildings around us who are trying to basically, their goal is to use whatever measures they can to steal the resources of other countries, to feed the greed of the corrupt elite, the capitalist elite that basically run this country. And I, um, I'm also concerned about the war on our rights and democracy in this country. And the, those same people use various methods of racism to divide us. They use legal bribery to buy the politicians. They um, voter suppression to keep people's voices silent and use the media. I mean, this is not all news to you, but use the media to silent vo silence voices. And instead of real news, we see practically 24 hours of celebrity gossip and a deep analysis of the uh, tweets of a psychopath. So my time in the embassy was very inspiring to me. The, the unity and the collective consciousness that I saw among our group is something I feel uh, it exists in, with other groups, but I feel we really have to think of building ties and realizing how much all of our issues are connected and it's so important to build coalition and maintain in coalition with other groups if we're going to turn this around 
and reach people that are beyond just our circle of friends. I'm not saying we're doing that today, but I, I know it can be tiring to walk around empty buildings yelling slogans at each other. We want to do more than that. And if we work together and use our numbers, the strength of our numbers, um, we'll be able to do that. Um, and Adrian? Oh, it's okay. So, uh, and we should not be intimidated. We need to keep up the fight and do it together. That's how we're going to be successful. Okay. Thank you, David. My name is Adrian Pine. I am a university professor. I talk for a living, and I know when it's time to shut up. Um, uh, there's nothing I could say here that hasn't been said better already. Uh, so I just want to uh, first ask any of the embassy protectors who want to join us here up on stage to come up right quickly. Um, it's okay. Uh, ben, whoever is out there and wants to join us on stage. Juliana, get up. Martha, is there a step up? There's a step on the other side if you want to go up there. Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, I was charged with hurting everybody up here, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say after. I'm going to hand it off to Anya. No, I've spoken enough today. Let's see. Somebody. Any... I feel like uh, let's hear from a protector who we haven't heard from yet today. No, or Margaret. She knows. <laughs> so I know what to say, apparently. <laughs> what I want to say is that we so appreciate every single one of you who came out today. We so appreciate all of the Embassy Protection Collective members, all the Embassy Protectors, because there were so many. There were protectors on the inside of the Embassy. There were protectors on the outside of the embassy. There were protectors who were watching what was happening and sharing the news and letting people know. And all of us, all of us were key to the success of the embassy defense. And it continues because the Trump, I'm going to call it the Trump regime, right? They're not giving up. They're, they're building terrorist camps along the Venezuelan border in Colombia. They're practicing trying to get paramilitaries into Venezuela to destroy the infrastructure to massacre innocent people. And so our work continues. The economic war against Venezuela continues and we have to demand no more regime change, no more military aggression, no more unilateral coercive measures. They're not sanctions, it's economic war. And so we say no to that. We say yes to obeying international law, respecting the sovereignty of the nations, and resolving our conflicts in a way that intelligent beings can do, not through a violence, but through dialogue and negotiation. And so we're going to wrap it up. We want to thank all of the embassy protectors for being here today, and everyone, we're going to march. Are you all ready to march? We're going to march to the United Nations to let the United Nations know, surprise, the United States is not above the law. The United States has to obey the law too. And as people who live in the, in the current largest empire in the world, the most rogue state, the most violator of law, it is our responsibility to tell the United Nations that they have to do their job. I was going to cuss, but I don't think I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> they need to do their job and hold the United States accountable to the United Nations Charter, which says everything we're doing is illegal. So let's take the energy, let's take the knowledge that we have today, and let's take it to the streets and march down to the United Nations. So, so I'm going to ask our lead banner holders to assemble on the corner over here at 34th, this, that corner, and then we're going to fall in behind them. And there's signs over here. If you don't have a sign, come and get a sign next to the stage, okay? And make sure you come out tomorrow night. We have an amazing event at Community Church of New York at 40 East 35th Street. It starts at 6.30, but you have to register. So go to the People's Mo website and register. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Margaret.